And it's a shame because we are going to slide from a glorious first world country into a third world country. <laughs> we are on our way. How do you feel this? I feel this tension a lot though, as I become more conservative in the sense of recognizing that I've been born into the stream of history. I got exceptionally lucky because within the particular stream of history, I'm the inheritor of all sorts of miraculous institutions in the American society. And conserve meaning I want to protect those for my children, right? right? So on one hand, it's about protection and preservation. But you and I also share kind of radical critiques of a lot of status quo institutions most people take for granted, right? Well, that's the so paradox what's, so, of conservatism. I mean, the paradox of conservatism is that uh, if you just mindlessly want to conserve, very often what you want to conserve is a rotten society that's gone terribly wrong. Yeah. And especially one dominated by progressive ideas. So, right. I the whole idea of you're preserving non-preservation. Well, you certainly don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I face this when I teach my conservative political and legal thought. Um, deciding what it means to to conserve when all around you, you see things, trends, ideas that you don't want to conserve. So I right. think that what we ought to do is revive the term reactionary. You know, reactionary is another one of those uh, terms that the left has tarred and decided is, you know, completely nefarious and off limits and you know, racist and unacceptable. And as part of our not giving in to leftist rules and shibboleths, we have to say, no, being a reactionary is a positive thing. It's a good thing. We're going back to ways of doing things that were better right. than the ways that we do things now. Uh, so it's not enough to be a conservative. I think you have, in the current climate, you have to go beyond being a conservative and you know, return to the past, preserve, protect, and defend what is best in our culture, our achievements, our advances, our accomplishments, and revive some now discredited practices, institutions, and ideas. Yeah, I mean, like the preservation of some very basic goods, like tried and true, time-tested goods about mm -hmm. how to like flourish, require some a kind of radicalism, right? Like the way yes. we lived it, I was literally moving to a farm in the Virginia wilderness. Well, is, I mean, that's the Benedict option. I would say it does require strong countercultural uh, impulses and convictions and the willingness to make good on them. And that isn't always possible. I mean, obviously, one has to compromise, but you're always making distinctions. You're always sitting in judgment on the way things are done and saying, no, I'm not going to do it that way. For example, this is a little thing, but I don't have a smartphone. And that drives people crazy. I mean, the, the more adamantly they urge me to get a smartphone, the less likely it is that I will get one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's just to create this, this buffer of peace around me you know, where there's time and space and room to think. Because the most precious, I think, privilege today is to think for yourself. Of course, you're never thinking for yourself because you're always influenced by the past, by what's good in the past, by the advances and the accomplishments of one's culture, which I'm not gonna run down or denigrate because they are a really important form of who we are. But that doesn't mean just this indiscriminate exception of every new thing. I, I call that neophilia. And I think one of the more pernicious trends in our culture is this mindless, indiscriminate neophilia, the, the love of everything new. It leads to a youth culture, which is a complete inversion of the proper order of things. Right, you know, their children. To say yeah, that children are wiser don't, than don't, we don't, are. Don't defer to these They're idiots. the ones who should be in charge. We yeah. have to listen to them and all of this. You know, it leads to the culture of non-correction, which is that parents and authority figures are reluctant 
to correct uh, and criticize less experienced people, ignorant people. Uh, you find it in its most concentrated form in Greta Thunberg, the book right. on it. It's like, it's the basically, of Greta the, the progressive just are coming out and transparently saying the icon of our movement is an autistic 16 year old. Exactly. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All or right, you said it. To her. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. All right, that's fine with me. <laughs> well, but on the other hand, you know, the the old gray beards or the middle beards have not exactly covered themselves in glory. I know. Uh, and so, you know, the foreign policy establishment is completely bankrupt. Uh, scientists have, I think, besmirched themselves in, in, in an embarrassing way by adopting all of this anti-racism, mindless anti-racism nonsense, you know, the kind of anti-meritocratic rhetoric. Um, also COVID de Deferring well. to the least yeah. competent people uh, in our society. Uh, yeah, COVID is just a mess of confusion and irrationality. And authoritarian um, self-righteousness, though. Authoritarian self-righteousness, you know, data just refusing to even actually look at the basic data like what percentage of people are actually getting sick what percentage of people are actually going into the hospital just the the mask fetish which is utterly mindless and, and nothing more than performance art frankly if you look at the data at all with any kind of objective eye uh so that's pretty cringeworthy frankly yeah. so it's kind of hard to know where to look you know, to uh, for trusted for expertise. Guys. Yeah, for trusted expertise is very, very difficult at this point. And I feel sorry for young people. Uh, I see the tremendous confusion and and you know the doubts and self doubt that they experience. And I I get it. I really get it. Sorry. Uh, having three kids in their twenties of my own who are doing relatively well, but I really wouldn't want to be them. They can just look to me. Yeah. I mean, they could just let you know. <laughs>
geographically they actually have, which is ironic. Yeah, this is the you Charles know? Murray's point. Yeah, it's like this despite is all, apart. yeah, all this their is ostentatious is wokeness apart. and radicalism, they're like incredibly traditionalist. They get married, they have a couple kids, and they stay married, More and less. they focus on education yeah. and responsibility. And After a little discipline. bit of wild oat sewing, right, exactly. Up. So they reinvent the wheel, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. Um, but you know, the bottom half of society is truly in chaos. I mean, you mean like, right now? Right now, yeah. I mean, their families are a mess. Uh, there's a revolving door of multiple partner fertility, of cohabitation, of fragile and transient relationships. Don't even start on minorities and the way that you know the black community is living, which is almost a taboo subject at this point. It is a taboo subject, but you know, all you need to do is say 74% out of wedlock birth rate. And that tells you everything you need to know. Um, and that really has a harmful effect. And people are just cut loose from any adult script of what respectability and maturity means. The term respectability is another denigrated term on the left that's equated with whiteness, that's equated with you know, um, white supremacy, cultural hegemony, all of that, uh, respectability politics, that's a form of oppression, um, but respectability is an absolutely key set of norms, a life script that ordinary people need in order to make their way through life and maximize their chances for a decent existence. Right. I mean, they really do. And it's market tested. The idea being like there's a certain set of norms that have stood the test of time over the course of millennia. Right. It's like, history test. Right. And it doesn't produce perfect happiness. Not by any means. I mean, who said anyone you know, owed anyone perfect happiness? Well, right? the people <laughs> honestly think you know that the unhappiness that families do experience inevitably, and uh, that uh, you and I know, is right. just part of the part of the package. Uh, that they can somehow escape that. Right, but then the alternative is, okay, so people have been trying to manufacture an alternative vision where they clear away all that stuff and it's all just about maximizing individual liberty and freedom, like no strictures at all, whether biological or cultural or political, right? And that alternative has definitively led to perfect misery for everybody who adopts it, right? Well, like, I mean, is some, people, some people actually, uh, I think a, a kind of tiny lucky elite has really thrived on that kind of freedom, whether out of love yeah, like or a, extra ability or temperament or whatever, and they often tend to be elites who have a lot of influence, right? But, and they- I guess so, but I think it's some of these like, Bitcoin libertine types that are famous in libertarian circles that have like their four wives and the contracts are all on the blockchain and I look at and they and they microdose every six hours. They seem fucking lame to me. They seem lame and they seem unhappy. So I don't know I don't know who you're thinking of, like whatever libertine globalists, but I'm saying the crypto billionaires that I've seen who've been like, I'm gonna write my own script and live out on Seastead and have my four my four blockchain wives. You're not envious of them. Lame. Lame and miserable. <laughs> Lame and miserable. They need to get some sleep. They need to take a nap. And they need to take care of their kids. So anyway, I'm not impressed. But well, I, but I, 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 think, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, whether or not there are counterexamples, and there are always counterexamples, this is no blueprint for the mass of humanity. And right. I think it's a form of elite arrogance to take what works for a tiny minority and you're, you're doubting it even works for them, but okay, we don't really need to sell that. And then impose it on, you know, the great mass of mankind. It is a form of really heedless elite arrogance under the guise of, you know, uh, being just incredibly filled with love of humanity and concern for social justice and freedom. But the problem is, of course, there is this distinction between liberty and license that we tend to forget yeah. about. And that distinction seems to have gone by the board, unfortunately. Uh, and it just doesn't work for most people. I mean, for most people, um, they really need the guideposts. They, they thrive on the guideposts, even as restrictive as they will sometimes seem. Uh, at the end of the day, I think, all told, it makes for a happier life. And, you know, 
I will, I will shift gears a little bit and say that feminism has a lot to answer for here because sort of feminism in its extreme versions is really a we shall be as gods philosophy that says we can throw out you know all the wisdom of the past, all of the scripts of the past, all of the, the real distinctions uh, which are undeniably there and real and exist uh, and we can reconfigure and reinvent our entire life as we see fit, including, you know, making women into men, making men into women, yeah. creating one gender, and of course that gender will be male because that's the ideal, uh, and just setting these women adrift on this flotsam and jetsam sea of contradictory imperatives, uh, and that just produces an enormous amount of unhappiness. One of the things it's producing is lifelong childlessness. And I can tell you, you know, rare is the woman who can get to the end of her life childless without regret. And I don't think that will ever change. <laughs> My favorite version of feminism is 19-year-old Amy Wax at Yale in the second class that has girls who comes in and just kicks ass. That's the version of feminism I like. Camille Paglia says her version of feminism is Amelia Earhart, Catherine Hepburn feminism, where you clear away structural barriers of, of oppression and you have an open playing field and like whoever kicks ass can Success. Well, that's I, what I like. But you have to be careful about that. I knew you have reservations. Easily, I knew no. even if it involved me complimenting no, I'm you, okay with that. you still have reservations. She's like, well, don't get don't get carried away, you little squishy feminist. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I think you can never lose sight of the bell curve, which is those women are and always will be exceptional. Right. To set that up as the model for all women or most women is the formula for unhappiness. I absolutely agree that, you know, women should be free to express their talents and, you know, follow their bliss and all of that. And some women will be able to compete with men, um, you know, on their terms. And I think those terms should be quote unquote male terms because I think men build civilization, men set the standard. I would not be for changing the standard, but once again, those women are going to be exceptional. And I think that's what our society doesn't accept. You know, I said the other day to a group of students, it does not keep me awake at night. I don't lose any sleep over the fact that 50% of the people in the Harvard Physics Department are not going to be women. And they're not. I mean, that is just the way it is. Uh, right. Women and men have different profiles of interest, different profiles of talent, different profiles of ability. And to the extent that feminism says, no, that's not acceptable, we have to change that. It's gotta be 50-50 everywhere. It's a pernicious influence. Um, so let's not mistake the existence of an Amelia Earhart, you know, or a top, law professor or intellectual like Heather McDonald with, you know, what, what the norm for women is going to be. Right. So all your kids are all about 20 to 25 years older than mine. I have three also. They're 20 somethings. Yes. So uh, this is, do you have advice for me? And they're, they're, uh, they're, I'm, I, I, I'm reluctant to say this because I don't want to get them in trouble, but my greatest accomplishment, my proudest, is that none of my children is woke. I don't know how that happened. Well, I can imagine. Luck. No, because I have friends who are very conservative. Oh, no. I won't name them. Whose kids are really, really not just left, but like super left and that would be scary that would be very scary you don't have that much control when the culture is the way it is so you don't have any like action items for me to ensure that my kids also emerge i i don't think there's any guarantees i think there are um 
and this is just post hoc ergo propter hoc, yeah. you know, because I did it and it seemed to work. I'm thinking it does work, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I would be very countercultural about parenting. You know, do not hesitate to exert your authority to be an authority figure. Yeah. Um, do not apologize. Do not try to be a friend. Uh, you know, offer freedom. Obviously, you know, it's it's once again a question of balance, balancing um, your your acceptance of what your child is to the extent that it represents a constructive social role or can be shaped into a constructive social role in terms of their interests, you know, what they're interested in, what they'd like to do in life. My youngest daughter was in the drama world until COVID evaporated that. Not a career I would have chosen for her, if only because it's so tough. insecure and so tough, but I certainly wasn't going to say to her, well, you can't do it, you know. Right. Uh, if that's what you really want to do, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, so having, you know, giving children latitude to that extent, but at the same time expecting excellence, expecting maturity, expecting self-reliance, expecting hard work, uh, expecting constructive action, uh, expecting all that stuff and always, always saying, you know, find a partner, get married, have children. These are positive goods, you know, don't pretend that they're not important. Right. Um, be very purposive about those personal goals. Uh, so. Well, it seems know, like the, if there's a chance of, indoc of inoculation against the woke virus, it's actually not political from the parents. It's about cultivating some psychological resilience. Well, because so much, I think a lot of this a lot of the things that masquerade as ideological and political in like the woke social media space are people thinking there are political solutions to deep-seated psychological personal right, problems, personal right? Problems, but if right. you're like, if you are someone who has a grit, steely center and are grounded, I think you're much less likely to be co-opted. That's That would be my guess. Yeah, I mean, once again, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think in many ways I was lucky in that my kids were based, you know, uh, they they just kind of were born based. They're born but, based. But I think born the, based. I think the uh, philosophy is is you know summarized by this little couple that John Darbyshire told me. How small of all that human hearts endure, the parts that courts or kings can cause or cure. Right. I mean, no the the sort of sources and the solutions of a good society and of happiness are not these uh, big structural governmental, you know, programmatic uh, factors. I mean, unless you're just talking about extremes of oppression, like, you know, Marxism or Nazism or anything right. like that, obviously they're going to be horrible societies that ruin any chance of, of a good life or of happiness. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But I think in general, within the, the ambit of our modern, you know, post-enlightenment, capitalistic, democratic, technologically sophisticated society that uh, most of what makes or breaks you is on the personal level. Do you consider yourself religious? No, unfortunately. And I come from a religious family. How, we don't have to talk about, let me ask a couple of things. You, you can decline or we can modify the question, depending. Like how much do you think about death now? Well, I regret, if I did to do over, I would have, I think, raised my children a more in a more religious way. I would have joined a synagogue, I would have practice Judaism more assiduously. I mean, part of it was that I married, uh, my husband is only half Jewish and he wasn't raised with any religion. Um, so I but think- But you can't I, will yourself into that though, Amy. Well, like, but if I had married someone who was, you know, dedicate, more dedicated and, and interested in Judaism, I definitely would have 
probably gone along with that, and I think it would have been yeah. better for my kids. It would have been better because but you wouldn't have believed it though. You wouldn't. I know, but you wouldn't well, have. You like... know, Jews don't worry about believing anything. You know, but, uh, they. <laughs> They just, Leaf has nothing they just have an it. awesome cultural script. <laughs> yes, and actually... They just have an awesome cultural script. Theirs is the quintessential it's cultural good. Like, script. It's good. Talk about proof is in the pudding. It's the day-to-day, the day-to-day things they get, that you do. It's day-to-day, but it's also having certain habits built in that connect you to something generations right. that Past, go back. The and, bris. I often tell people, if you want to sort of summarize the genius of Judaism, it's the concept of the bris, which is the connection between past generations, mm-hmm. present generations, and future generations. The covenant, the thread that ties you from past to present to future. Right. Um, and that is indispensable, I think, to Judaism, so that you're not sort of set adrift uh, on this, you know, dimensionless space, but no, you take guidance from the past and you project investment in the future and hope in the future. The but it's not that. just that. That's very absurd. I know, but I'm saying, but I like I like the ego dissolving of I put on the yarmulke and I walk to synagogue and I know my great 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 grandfather did it and my yeah. great 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 grandson is also going to do it. Like that's incredible to be situated within this long lineage. Right. But it's also diff- and it's very difficult to of it. I mean the fact yeah. that there are things that you do, there are rules that you follow and you don't necessarily, you know, question them or get them fully justified to you, but they give your life shape and they give your life um, purpose and rhythm. The whole idea of the Sabbath as this periodic uh, elevation of your existence. Uh, I mean, all of that. There's there's real genius in that, and of course, it, it's had, it's proved itself through longevity. But of course, now it's all falling apart in the United States through intermarriage and other other mechanisms. I mean, that's formally against the, the Jews marrying the Gentiles. But so, well, do you, so you don't think what what? I'm not against it. It's just I see the effects of it. <laughs> We're diluting the brand, no question about it. I asked you how often do you think about death? Now I wanna ask, what do you think about death? Like death, how often do I think about death? And then what do you think about? I try not to think about death, but as you get older, of course, it's inevitable that you will be thinking about it, yes. And do you find it liberatory or just frightening in ways that are difficult to conceptualize or something else? I think neither. I think it's not terribly frightening to me. It's not liberating to me because I don't really feel the need to be liberated. There's nothing I really feel the need to be liberated from. I feel that my life is pretty much what I've chosen. I've been incredibly uh, fortunate and lucky, and I, I have more or less lived my life the way I've wanted to. So I don't really have significant regrets. I don't look back and say shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know. But on the other hand, I understand that life is this very brief and fleeting thing. Um, So I try not to think about death. I try to think about the next project, the next involvement. I try to be engaged. And I try to be engaged in something other than myself. You know, I think one of the maladies of the current generation of females is to be overly focused on the self. If I were to give advice, one of the pieces of advice I give to parents is, especially parents of girls, get them focused and involved in broader things, something other than themselves. Not the Insta feed. Their friends, their nails, their looks. I mean, not that looks aren't important or that people shouldn't try to look their best because I firmly believe that. Um, And I don't, I hate this whole anti-feminine or anti-masculine movement, you know, but women should not care about their appearance, men should not care about being manly or any of that. I'm just saying 
there's that should have a limited purchase on your mental energy. Your mental energy should be focused on, you know, broader issues, broader phenomena, nature, science, life, history, uh, all wonderful, interesting things that are out there in the world. And the least interesting thing is yourself. Right. But the dominant culture of therapeutic affirmation right. is that if a 14 year old girl says that she's suffering from anxiety, the way to cure her is just to compliment her excessively. To say that you're beautiful and you're perfect and you're lovely the way you are. You're beautiful exactly the way you are. Yeah. Well, of which, and it's, of course, and it's, it's not working. True up to a point, but then past a point, not well, true. It's, it's worth saying once. We all have to, you know, be our best selves. Be yourself, but be your best self. Right. Is I think, and that might take some work. It, it might take some work. Sacrifice. It takes hardship. It takes sacrifice. It takes effort. Um, you might have you to won't earn. always be happy. You yeah. won't always be comfortable. Right. Uh, you won't always feel good. Yeah, I think that's a really important lesson to impart. You know, what is it? Who is it? The guy who wrote the big book, Twelve Rules of Life. I can never remember. George his Peterson. Name. Yeah, life is suffering. That's a good place to start.